Okay. Good. Good evening, everyone. Um, let me introduce myself. I will do that in a minute. What I will uh, talk about um, tonight is um, for those of you who have followed or who are following RhymeDB, you already know that um, just uh, two weeks ago we launched um, our uh, managed service, uh, which is called the RhymeDB Oasis. Um, now, tonight I don't want to go, uh, go into any marketing talks and stuff like that. I really mm -hmm. keep it technical. Um, so I will share you with you some experience what we have on doing this on AWS. We're doing it on multiple providers, so I will also give some uh, comparison um, to uh, how uh, we feel about AWS compared to others and what experiences we have. So I like to make this practical talk, so if there are any questions, feel free and shoot. Not me, but <laughs> I don't know. That. Okay, so um, I will give a short introduction into Rhyme Oasis so you know what it is. <clears throat> then uh, we'll uh, briefly um, touch the, um, the architecture and then dive into what it looks like when what we're actually running on AWS and other cloud providers. Um, that's the first technical uh, part. The second technical part I want to talk about uh, Oasis networking, which is also um, Rather on the low level uh, side of the cloud providers. Um, and I would like to uh, end with some conclusions. First, a bit about myself. Um, my name is Eric Marsma. I'm the team lead for RhymeDB Oasis. Um, also, the, uh, the main architect. I have been working with uh, RhymeDB for quite a while now, uh, but I don't do anything on the database. Um, absolutely not. Um, so I always work around the database. Uh, try to make it actually usable for people that can easily start it. Um, so you will find my name in things like the Go driver, uh, Kubernetes operator, and starter, all kinds of things, um, as long as it doesn't touch the actual database. <laughs> um, and if you look on the right, that's a picture of what I do outside uh, uh, around the um, Just Last week, we were in a show in Bremen with uh, our model trains and tried to have a lot of fun there. And of course, that is also highly automated, what you expect from a software guy. <laughs> okay, let's get started. So let's talk about the RhymeDB Oasis. Our RhymeDB Oasis is a, our managed <coughs> service. Um, so we had a lot of uh, customers talking to us and saying, well, this is a great database that you have, but um, now, I still have the problem that I have to run it and I have to manage it and I have to maintain it and I have to watch it and it's all kinds of annoying stuff. Please don't make me do that. Um, so we said, okay. Um, so what we allow you to do with RhymeDB Oasis is run an RhymeDB, what we call deployment. I'll come in the minute, next slide what that actually is, in the cloud. Um, and in the cloud means your favorite cloud provider, whether that is currently Google or AWS or soon Azure or in the future maybe others, um, we don't care that much. Um, we want to make that layer such that uh, we can easily uh, run the deployments and you have the same functionality no matter where you go. Um, and of course, since this is a managed service, we really manage it for you. So we monitor it 24 seven. Um, we make sure that uh, if there are any critical uh, security updates are being done, et cetera. Um, and we also make sure, and that is of course, I always say security for 2020, we have to make sure that it is safe. Um, nothing is probably worse than getting a notification saying, well, our RMD needs so many, we don't want that. Let's be very clear. Um, and it has to be scalable. So we want to have uh, you running uh, small deployments. We want you to have running large deployments. And large means really large. Um, and I, I often talk to, uh, to our customers as well. And um, they keep surprising me from time to time with numbers where you're like, can we do that? <laughs> yeah, probably. But then the fun starts, of course. Um, and last but not least, it is built and operated by the RhymeDB engineers. And in this office, um, that uh, this office actually houses the majority of the RhymeDB engineers, um, but none of my team members, uh, because my team is completely distributed. Um, myself, I live in the Netherlands. I come from there. And all the developers also in the Netherlands. We have 
two people in Berlin and we have one in Hungary. Um, so we are spread out over Europe and hopefully soon we will add the US in there as well. So what is a deployment on Oasis? Um, those of you who know Kubernetes uh, probably are familiar with the term deployment. This is something else. We're talking about a database uh, deployment, more precise, a cluster deployment. OriDB can be deployed in many different ways from a very simple single server instance um, all the way to a highly available cluster. And um, I have been pushing extremely hard that in Oasis we run clusters uh, because we have to manage them. Um, myself and my team get called in the middle of the night if something goes wrong. So I said it has to be highly available, otherwise we cannot maintain it. Um, of course, that yields some additional challenges, but we are dealing with that. Um, and what we have is we have various deployment models. Um, ParameterDB as a multi-model database um, serves lots of different use cases. And um, if you are more on the graph side, you need a slightly different <coughs> way to uh, set up your cluster than if you are a pure document store, for example. It has to do with greater performance and how you optimize things. Um, and we are giving you, at the moment, two models uh, where one is really optimized for graph and one is more optimized for document slash key value um, options. Um, and last but not least, um, we're using the enterprise version. So around DB as a community version as well as an enterprise version. So with the enterprise version, you get all the goodies um, that you would normally pay for. And of course, with around DB, you pay for it as well. That's, uh, too bad, but um, and it's running. Um, I really told it is running. Uh, we want to run where the users want us to run. Um, so, in uh, I think earlier this year, we had a poll uh, like, What is your favorite cloud provider? Um, rest is short in this room. I'm not going to lie, AWS was number one. Um, and um, I think if there was then second was Azure, and third was Google. And fourth was digital ocean, as far as I know. Um, and then there was nothing for a long time. Um, so those are the four main ones. And uh, at least the first three um, are the ones that we are going to, uh, to tackle. The AWS and Google is in place, and Azure is a work in progress. So let's, that was all functional. Now you have an impression. If you want to try it, go to cloud.orangodb.com. Give it a try. You can try it out for free. Um, let's take a look at how that looks under the hood. Um, I have extremely simplified the picture, uh, otherwise I need a lot of slides and we don't have time for that. Um, essentially, we have two different types of uh, planes in Oasis. We have a control plane and we have uh, what we call data clusters. And um, these boxes, so this box, is a Kubernetes cluster, and here you see three Kubernetes clusters, but it can be much more. Um, and there are lots of components in there. I have just given a few, uh, but if you look at the, our control plane, I think we're now uh, running somewhere in the range of between 35 and 40 services uh, in there, and all are running, or pretty much all of them are uh, running in high availability mode, so we're running quite a number of pods there. Um, and um, that's actually the fun part. Um, because we want to make sure that it keeps running and we can upgrade it without you guys noticing it. Um, and usually we manage to do that. Of course, being a developer, never say never, but uh, we know how that goes. Um, the data cluster is a different story because that is where we actually run deployments for customers. Um, and so while this is in essentially a single place, this can be anywhere on the planet. Um, so we have uh, things running in uh, Google Frankfurt, we have things running in uh, North America, we have uh, at the moment um, I think five different regions for AWS and that number is growing and all of them have at least one of these data clusters in them. And actually the data cluster is the part that I will focus on through the majority of this talk. Um, and um, 
quick words about the control plane. It's really the central core. So that's where our uh, dashboard is uh, hosted. That's where our primary API handlers are running and so on. Um, and the fun part starts uh, here. And that is that the control plane is also responsible for creating and removing um, data clusters. Um, so we don't do anything with uh, spinning up data clusters manually with scripts or whatever. That's all done automatically. And creating is one thing. Uh, we'll show later on that removing is actually even harder than creating. Um, and of course, being a central core, this is also what data clusters taught. So let's talk about the data cluster. What is the data cluster? It is running deployments from customers. That is its sole purpose in life. Um, of course, we need a few helpers there, but not that much. And we designed this thing to be a simple but specialized Kubernetes cluster, specialized in such a way that we say we have wherever we run, whether it's Google or Azure or AWS, I don't care. Um, we have a infrastructure layer that is the same no matter what, mostly. It's not entirely true, but we try to do that uh, as far as we can say. And I usually make a comparison with our data clusters. The abstraction layer that we have in here is similar to the Java virtual machine promise in the 90s. It was also intended as an abstraction layer. Of course, not about infrastructure, about code, but it is very close. And we want to make this common layer. Um, and that works very well because there are only a very few exceptions to the rule where we say everything that we build for one provider works also for the others. Um, and that's great. Uh, can you use the uh, Kubernetes services of these different cloud providers? Yes. You... Yes. Okay. We, uh, we use the managed Kubernetes from uh, Google and from uh, AWS. Mm -hmm. um, but as I will show you in a minute, the managed service from one is not exactly the same as the managed service from the other. Um, <laughs> slight spoiler. Um, finally, we have a network layer. Um, I already mentioned in the agenda, uh, we're going to talk about uh, network layers. Um, so just keep in mind that there is something in there and we'll discuss that later. So now let's talk about the data cluster on AWS. So first of all, how do we create a data cluster? Um, it starts even a bit further, like why do we want to create a data cluster? Um, and it's not that upfront we decide, okay, it's that region and we now put something in there. No, only if there is a customer that actually says, now I want to have a deployment in that region, then we decide, do we already have a data cluster in there? Does it have the capacity? Yes, then we allocate it to the existing one. If not, we create a new one. And that entire process is completely automatic. Um, depending on the provider, um, spinning up a complete data cluster can take anywhere from five to 25 minutes, um, where unfortunately AWS is really the slow guy. Um, and we have um, so-called data cluster operators who are responsible for building and destroying these things. Um, so we have a piece of code that says, I'm going to create a data cluster for AWS. And that piece of code has the same function as its brother that does it for Google, but the implementation is way different. Um, that is really uh, the big difference. So that is where we implement this single layer where we say, okay, the end result should be the same from uh, the, the, the high point of view, um, but how we get there is of course completely different. Final remark about the data clusters is that these things are designed to be pool only. Um, and that has to do with security. We envision that uh, at some point there will also be uh, data clusters specific to individual customers. That has to do with VPCs and all that stuff. Um, and uh, we want to make sure that we're not actually pushing stuff into that data cluster, but the data <coughs> cluster is always pulling us because that allows us for much greater flexibility uh, going forward. Now, what does it actually mean to create a data cluster on AWS? If I could make this slide for Google, I would have two words, and that's it. Uh, for AWS, um, it is a lot. Um, unfortunately, the AWS APIs for EKS 
um, the, uh, the Kubernetes, managed Kubernetes is there, but you cannot just say, well, I am going to spin up a Kubernetes cluster and have fun, do it. No, you have to create your VPC, you have to create your security groups, you have to create your AMIs, or at least find them, networking, all that stuff. You have to do everything yourself, which in the beginning, I'm not going to lie, was extremely annoying. Like, do we really have to do all that stuff? Um, and the answer was unfortunately yes, plus a couple of more things that we forgot in the beginning. Um, and, but, Later on, it is also um, it also gives you power uh, because it also allows you to really design the things um, the way you want it, without uh, somebody at these cloud providers trying to be smart for you. So there's always two sides of the matter. Um, and yes, it takes a lot longer to uh, to develop, but later you can customize it a lot more. Um, and at the moment, we're at the point where that is really helping us. Um, but it is a lot. And um, now if I like at, look at the removal, um, again, it is fully automatic, um, mostly. Um, and yeah, we still have bugs, of course, but uh, that happens all the time. It's still the responsibility of these data cluster operators. And essentially what it does is it is just removing all the resources in the reverse order of the creation. So our data cluster operators essentially have just a loop that they keep doing all the time and say, okay, do I need to build this thing? Yes, then I'm going to create, 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 create. Do I need to remove it? Then destroy, 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 destroy in, in different order. Um, so far, so good. Um, sounds all easy, um, but in reality, and certainly on AWS, it is not that easy. Um, so what did we find? Um, first of all, AWS creates lots of resources on the fly for you, which you do not anticipate upfront. For example, if you are creating a um, service in Kubernetes in an EPS cluster, um, <coughs> and say that is a service of type load balancer, it will create a ELB for you. And with that, all the security rules and <coughs> stuff that gets, uh, uh, you get for free. Um, now that's fine, but at some point you also have to clean it up. So you have to remove it. Um, and then um, there is a second problem that these resources have a lot of dependencies. So, and if you don't destroy them in exactly the right order, it is going to complain. It is going to say, ah, you cannot do that because whatever, this is the dependency. The annoying part is it's not going to exact, tell you exactly what a dependency is. It's just going to tell you there is a dependency, good luck. Um, so that, that is annoying and um, we have this loop, removal loop, um, because we know that you can tell a resource to say, okay, you should go away, um, but it's not uh, away right away. These things are mostly asynchronous um, and you just have to ping afterwards like, is it still there? No. Okay, now I can continue. Oh, I have to wait. Well, that's so. There's a lot of uh, tweaks in, in there that uh, work that way. Um, another challenge that we have is um, not all resources have tags, and we use tags, whether it's tag or annotation or whatever. Um, we use that to store our own information in there. Um, and sometimes you need it, and sometimes you have to. Um, uh, we would wish that all resources just have tags, no matter what. Um, but yeah, that is where you can see that AWS is by far the oldest one and um, things are growing there as well. Um, so yeah, that is what it is. <coughs> Final, really an annoying thing, um, you have to write a lot of helpers um, to detect your errors. There is very little structure of error handling in there and we even had to go to the thing of parsing error messages, which I absolutely hate, but um, yeah, there, there is just no way around that. Um, and then um, the, the, the documentation is great, um, if you can find it, but the documentation is huge. So uh, we're we are building all this stuff in, in Go, 
And if you look at the documentation for the Glow driver, just trying to load that into your browser is a challenge on its own because that page is so tremendously huge that it will break your browser if you don't have a big computer. Um, but once it's there, uh, the documentation itself is good, absolutely. And did you wrote everything yourself, uh, or was there some library or something? For for the, the, the clients, you mean, or for the operators? Uh, for the operators, so that you use Terraform wouldn't work, but something no, similar? We, the, um, the operators we wrote literally from scratch. Um, and we uh, we could have used things like Terraform or whatever. And actually, for our control plane, we do use that. Um, but we did well, for us. It was very important that these data clusters could spin up <coughs> and also go away um, essentially automatically. Um, so, for example, in our staging area, uh, we are literally running tests where we're spinning up a data cluster and then throwing it away within 20 minutes because we don't need it anymore. Uh, and it, it has to be that easy to do. Um, and certainly with our, let's say, um, uh, sites for the future where we see that there will be much more data clusters than regions, um, you just have to do that automatically. We didn't, um, uh, from, from literally the first day that we started this project, um, I've been very clear, everything we do has to scale. And running scripts manually doesn't scale. Okay? Good. That is about how we build a uh, data cluster. And then, of course, in the end, we just have a plain Kubernetes cluster. And then we can put stuff in there and, and run stuff. And again, take back to where I said we decided to be pool only. Um, so we literally inject a single pod in that cluster. And done automatically by by the operator, and afterwards everything is done from inside um, the data cluster, um, and that makes it really easy because if you have um, a communication problem, um, you have one point to look at, um, and um, if you are talking about authentication, which of course is extremely relevant in this case as well, um, you also have a single point where you should start looking. And one of the things that we found out with this whole project is that when you are running so many uh, concurrent Kubernetes clusters in many different locations, um, just managing your cube configs is already a challenging task. Um, I can show you if you just for the fun of it, uh, wrong one, uh, where is my... That is my list of cube configs. Um, so it is just big. Um, good. Um, let's move on to uh, the second uh, part. Um, just a couple of words about networking. Um, our data clusters are multi tenant, uh, which means that um, no matter who is creating a deployment, as long as you run it in the same region, chances are that you end up in the same data cluster. Um, now, of course, I already said in the beginning, security is absolutely paramount for us. So we have to make sure um, that somebody uh, cannot access uh, the database of the, of the neighbor, essentially. And that's even more uh, pressing for AramaDB because AramaDB has a great feature, um, which is called a Fox service. You can run some uh, JavaScript code inside your database. Now you can imagine what kind of fun <coughs> the hacker would have trying to build something in JavaScript to attack the neighbor from that part. Uh, so that's obviously something that we wanted to prevent. Um, combine that with the fact that if you run a EKS class, so you have a single VPC. Um, you don't have the option to say, well, I have a namespace and I put a separate VPC in there. Um, so we needed a way to have very strong network separation and do that in a way that was separate from the database. Uh, we don't want to rely on any um, user code for that. We just want to have very strict walls um, between the different deployments, but of course also between the deployments and our platform, um, which is directional because 
we want to be able, uh, our metrics collection should be able to reach out to the deployments and say, give me your metrics. But at the same time, the deployment should not be able to talk to our metrics server and say, give me back my metrics. That's not what we want. And the solution for that is Cilium. Um, who of here, you have already heard about Cilium? That's not all. Okay, then I'm going to um, give you some indication about uh, what Cilium is. Cilium is a network policy layer, um, um, and it is using uh, BPF. Um, so that is a um, fil packet, packet filtering technique in the Linux kernel, very deep down in the Linux kernel, um, that can steer your network. And um, you can do a lot of nice tricks with Cilium. Um, the key part that we do is um, we block, uh, we put very big walls between namespaces. So what we do is we deploy every deployment, uh, database deployment in a separate Kubernetes namespace. And we just say within that namespace, everyone can talk to each other, even there with certain limitations, but you cannot talk to your neighbor uh, namespace uh, at all. Um, but you can, of course, talk from the internet to that namespace, provided your credentials are right. Um, and you can do a lot. You can even go on uh, pod level based on the labels of your pods, for example, say this one can talk to that one, but only in that direction and not in that direction. It is an extremely powerful tool. Um, and given that uh, this thing is implemented essentially deep down in your uh, Linux kernel, it is also extremely fast. And of course, if you're building a database, you don't want your network uh, to be slow. Um, uh, what is the difference to Istio? Um, Istio can actually make use of Cilium. Um, so with Istio uh, being a surface mesh, um, you are talking about things at a much higher level. And one of the possibilities that Cilium has is to integrate with Istio. Um, so it not only helps to fulfill the promise that Istio itself has, but it also adds much more strict uh, constraints in it. So for example, Syria, uh, Istio by default uh, works with uh, sidecar proxies. Um, for Cilium, you don't need that because it completely takes over the networking stack. Okay. Sure. <clears throat> Cilium is a, is a completely different um, overlay network, as I understand, right? Yeah. So um, EKS normally comes with this AWS uh, network, mm -hmm. and they say you can change it, but then you have some disadvantages uh, with integrating the two. <laughs> Did you have some facts where you say? Uh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, Great integration into uh, introduction to this slide. Um, I, I'll come back on, the, on your question. Um, Cilium in reality. Cilium is a great promise. Um, and to be honest, Cilium is also actually great in reality, but it has to work. Um, because if it doesn't work, it is able to completely break your cluster. And I mean completely. Um, and um, we have had quite a number of challenges with that. Um, thank God everything is now under control. Um, but <clears throat> what Cilium promised you is that it is a uh, cross provider. Um, but that comes at a cost. And that means the cost is there that setting up Cilium is slightly different for AWS <coughs> than it is for Google, than it is for Azure. Um, and uh, they're also they're trying to have this. Um, common layer, um, and that is the layer of how you specify your rules and things like that. But in the end, the details are slightly different. And as soon as you go on this level of um, network influencing, the devil is absolutely in the details. Um, just to give you an indication, um, we are currently still using Cilium 1.5, which is a bit old, not uh, the newest. And um, it is influencing the way that uh, your pods get an IP address. Um, and of course, you have to make sure that your pods get unique IP addresses. That's pretty obvious. Um, so what it is trying to do is it is trying to figure out, okay, you're running on that node. So now I'm picking 
the last digit of your IP address of that node and merging that somewhere else and then doing some nice tricks with it, um, which is kind of a stupid approach. Um, so they ditched it in 1.6, fortunately, um, but that has given us some, uh, some headaches. Uh, because if you happen to have a node that has the same last digit as an existing node, suddenly it doesn't work anymore. Which, yeah, of course you don't want that and it doesn't scale, but um, it's tricky. And related to that is the pod zero. So that is the flag on a node in, in Kubernetes that says this is the range of IP addresses that you can use for pods on this node. Um, on Google, that is set uh, by Google itself. Um, no problem whatsoever, it just works. Um, on AWS, it's not set, um, and then you get this kind of weird tricks. Fortunately, in the newer versions, um, Cilium is now smart enough to automatically set that on AWS as well, and then the problems are gone. Um, but um, it did result in this thing being extremely stable on Google and giving us quite a number of headaches on, uh, on AWS. Um, the good thing is that um, their development, so the development of the Cilium team is fast. Um, the weak thing is that the attention to older versions is not that great. They can easily say, well, you have to upgrade to a newer version and we are not going to backport this fix to the older version, good luck. Um, the positive thing is that they are extremely helpful on their Slack chat. So, if you want to try it out, go to their Slack channel and, and just talk to the guys because they are really helpful. Final thing that we found out with Cilium is that um, the inspection, so the inspection of what is actually going on and if there is a network error, why, where is it coming from, um, is currently weak. Um, so you have to go into all kinds of logs and details and you really have to know the thing uh, in order to figure out what's going on. Now recently, last week, they launched a new project called Hubble, um, and that is intended to give much more insight um, in this, and it can give you all kinds of nice things like where are my DNS errors coming from, and how many 500-something errors do I have in my HTTP, and all that stuff. Um, so a lot is going on there, um, but let's be honest, it is still a bit of a moving target. Good. That was networking. I want to um, end my talk with a few observations. Um, let's start with Cilium. Um, we find Cilium to be very helpful. Um, not only the product, but also the team behind it. Uh, they are very helpful. Um, unfortunately, it's not as stable as we hoped it to be, um, but we see a lot of progress in there. So we like it a lot, and I can strongly recommend it. Then looking at AWS, we have a bit of mixed feelings. Um, and now I'm becoming to be a bit careful in this room, of course, um, but I'm, I'm Dutch, so I can be a bit blunt. My colleagues know that. Um, and it is pretty clear that AWS is the older guy in the room. Uh, you can see that from their API design. Things are being added all the time. And things are being done slightly different uh, in, in newer versions. Um, that is sometimes annoying, but it also means that things are more stable. Um, because in reality, AWS is just more stable than Google. Um, of course, you also have your outages and what have you, but um, overall, if you look at it, they're doing a great job there. Um, comparing features, um, I always say that it really is more than a day job to just figure out all the features that AWS is offering you because it's just insane. Um, and we only use a tiny fraction of that. Um, also because we don't need this vendor login, um, it's not necessary for us. Um, but also on the simple side, like EC2 and EKS, just the, the sheer number of features that they have, something like provision IOPS, which of course for database development, um, is something that's still lacking on the Google side. So um, there is a lot of maturity on AWS, except for EKS. <laughs> because EKS, um, I cannot say uh, a lot of friendly things about that, because um, in all honesty, uh, the API is just something where, at least in my our impression, they just bolted something on, like, oh yeah, we need to have Kubernetes as well, let's do it. 
Um, but um, I, to be honest, I find it laughable that if you go to their documentation, then you can say, okay, create a cluster, and then you create a cluster, and then they say, oh, great, you have a dashboard for that. You don't want to do it with the API. Um, then you have a cluster, you start spinning it up, and they're like, where are my nodes? Well, there are no nodes because you don't need create the Kubernetes control plane. You have to build your own worker nodes separately. Um, that is a bit stupid, if you're honest. So I hope that EKS is going to grow and then be a bit more mature because the rest of the infrastructure just deserves it. Um, and, uh, and in the meantime, we just have fun with it. That was my talk. Any questions? What's with the implementation of Azure? Um, it is coming. <laughs> yeah, the implementation of Azure is something that we have now just started. Um, so we have already uh, done some uh, uh, some ground laying experiments of how easy it is. Um, we know from that that at least their API is much closer to Google than it is to uh, AWS. Um, so remember this list of all the resources where it's uh, for Google it's two, for, for Azure it's also two. Um, so I think that Azure has been looking very closely at uh, GKE uh, for their uh, APIs. Um, the thing that we do not know yet, and which to be honest gives us a bit of a worry, is the stability of Azure. Um, because it's just a lot younger and um, has a much less proven track record. But API-wise, um, it is looking pretty good. Yeah. What was the main reason you decided to use AKS or Kubernetes as, as cluster? Normally, people say, okay, if you have a cluster and you deploy stateless component, normally, even some people recommend to do your stateful um, deployment outside the Kubernetes. Absolutely. Yeah, that has been a uh, interesting discussion from day one. Um, because it is absolutely true that Kubernetes has a reputation of working great for stateless and being absolutely lousy for stateful things. Um, before we started this project, um, I think, what is it now, two and a half years ago, we started on a different project which was called the Kubernetes Operator. Um, and that is a piece of software that you install in Kubernetes that completely manages a uh, a RiverDB deployment for you. That's also exactly what we use in here. And um, for us, um, with a strong background in Kubernetes, it was an absolute no-brainer to still go for Kubernetes because of all the lifecycle management uh, features and all the recovery features in there. Um, and the thing that makes it now a bit easier compared to, let's say, uh, five or ten years ago, is that the um, uh, persistent volumes that you now have um, are actually extremely performant, even if they are not on the same node um, physically as where your things are running. Um, so the way that the, the SSDs are connected to the nodes is <coughs> um, huge amounts of uh, network speed caching and all that stuff. Um, makes it uh, a lot easier. Um, and, and we actually use that feature um, because we have the volumes on persistent nodes that are disconnected from the actual nodes where we run uh, the storage, which means that if we need to uh, rotate a node or rebuild it completely, uh, we can easily do that. It's just automatically scheduled somewhere else and attaches to that again. Um, and it works perfectly fine again. But primarily the the, the, the self-healing properties <coughs> of Kubernetes that is something that is really helpful. And uh, that at least that was the, the goal initially. Uh, that is proving to be correct. Um, and the other thing that makes it really helpful is that um, this, because everything is API-based and you have your tooling uh, with kubectl to inspect everything, um, I can go in here and inspect everything without us needing to build all kinds of um, dedicated layers or SSH into whatever. Uh, we just don't need that. Yeah. And that makes that makes our life a lot easier. So finally, it paid off. Absolutely. Yes. 
Yes. What was your alternative to to Kubernetes as platform? If you want to, go, was it the architecture you want to do, or was it to be a managed service? Or a, you know what I mean? Um, you want to? Uh, <laughs> no. Okay. Do you want to go to Kubernetes? Was that your aim uh, in the project, or do you want to go make a managed service? No, no, no. Uh, the fact that we chose Kubernetes is a implementation detail. Um, we don't think that it's relevant to our customers. Of course, the effect of that is relevant to our customers because we can build it quicker, for example. Um, but uh, for the customer, it does not make a uh, difference at all. They don't see Kubernetes, they don't have access to it, they just see a managed service. So if you look at it, how we could have also built it is just plain uh, virtual machines and, and run it on there. Uh, our RDB also has some some tooling uh, to start clusters uh, on just plain machines or virtual machines, whatever you like. But the management part of that would be a order of magnitude more complex than what we have now. Um, do you also need a use operators in your controller cluster to spin up the other clusters? Yes. Is also the controller. Yes. Yeah, we actually use several layers of, of operators. So. Uh, for the data clusters, I already spoke about the data cluster operators. Um, it is a bit of a definition question, but technically they are not really operators in the sense that they create different Kubernetes resources or something like that. Um, they create complete new Kubernetes clusters. Um, inside the data cluster itself, we are actually using our own QParameterB product, which is an operator in the traditional sense of the word. Uh, to spin up the uh, Arango uh, deployment. So if we say, if a customer says, I want to spin up a new deployment, um, the only thing what happens is that uh, the data, data cluster is created if needed, and then the infrastructure in the data cluster only says, now I need to make a, what is called Arango deployment resource, which is a custom resource implemented by our Kubernetes operator. And then the Kubernetes operator takes over and says, okay, that means that I need to spin up pods for that servers and that all of that stuff. And how do you do the lifecycle management of the EKS? Yeah. So can it be done um, without downtime of the class? Yeah, that is actually, uh, that, that is where we learned that this whole business of AWS, where you have to do all the resources yourself, actually is a bad idea. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Because what we do if we, um, in, as a comparison in Google, you can say upgrade that notebook and then it starts upgrading it one by one. Um, we now found that it is doing that in such an aggressive way uh, that it's not really good for a database. Um, on AWS, you don't have that because you can say the node is using this AMI and you can change the underlying AMI. So the only thing that you have is build a new node. So, if we are going from um, to a new Kubernetes version, for example, what we do is we add new outer scaling groups with the new AMI, um, and then uh, make sure that they have the same number of instances as our old scaling groups, and then we start coordinating the old nodes. Um, and for those who don't know that in Kubernetes, coordinating means don't schedule anything on there. And we have uh, our own piece of logic that says, hey, this pod is running on a node that is coordinate. So apparently you want to get rid of that. And then we get rid of these pods in the right order. So we have the benefit of knowing exactly with all the guys here how to run an ArangoDB cluster. Um, so we also know how exactly to move it without uh, the customer seeing anything. Of it. And that means that we then delete them from the old nodes. Um, Kubernetes will automatically take care of scheduling it somewhere else. And since all the old nodes are corded, it can only go to the new ones. Um, and so that takes uh, some time. It can easily take two or three hours before that entire game is over. And then when the game is over, the auto scaler kicks in and says, okay, apparently you don't need this node anymore, get rid of it. And then we eventually, uh, as soon as the, out the old auto scaling group is empty, so there are no more instances, we get rid of it. And that is, um, it was very cumbersome to implement that, um, but we now like it so much that we're also going to do exactly the same for Google. 
and uh, the, the knowledge uh, is all inside the operator on the class itself, so that he don't that he has um, that he evacuates the pods from the marked autoscaling group. Yeah, that, that's the good part of, of Kubernetes. All the information is in what's called the Kubernetes API server. Um, so it knows exactly, and even if our control plane is down for whatever reason, that can just continue and our database is, uh, will keep running there without any problem. All righty. Thanks very much. Cool. Thank you.